good morning. I'm working on a bunch of kind of unfun stuff today, like a bunch of garden clean out. I don't think that this video is gonna be super interesting, but I thought I would film it anyway because it just kind of shows what's going on this time of year. We got our first like really good frost last night. So a bunch of my annuals are very sad. So I'm gonna start kind of the clean out of that process. I need to cut some blight out of a crab apple, clean out some garden spaces, get some garlic planted. I hope, I mean, I get all that done today. It's a beautiful day otherwise, like the sun is shining and the wind isn't blowing. So anyway, I'm really thrilled about that, but I wanna show you this poor marooned coleus that I have enjoyed so much this season what it looks like today. So sad, you guys, look at that. So there's like one lone little patch that survived the frost last night. So this clearly needs to go. Now the lemon coral is a zone seven, so it should survive for a while. If I get to it, I'd like to dig some of it up and bring it inside because it does winter as a house plant. I have very mixed feelings in fall. Fall's actually my second favorite season. Um, after spring. Spring is my favorite because spring's awesome. Spring is when everything starts to grow, everything's fresh. We all feel like we have energy after a winter to like tackle projects again. Um, fall, I love it because it's a reprieve and a break after all the intense summer heat and all the work. Like it's nice to have a little bit of relaxation um, time, but it's also sad to see all of the plants that you've worked so hard to tend throughout the year start to like perish day after day. There's more plants that are perishing out there. So anyway, I'm in the barn right now and I'm gonna grab some, some supplies. <laughs> First off, I'm gonna grab the pole pruner. This will help me with my crab apple trimming. Okay, so I think I'm just gonna start with these tools. These are actually things I always have in my trailer. I always have the blower because I use that a lot to clean up after myself. Um, I always have like this little floral shovel in here. Uh, and then my kneeling pad. I have starter fertilizer, which I actually can take out now at this point. I always have my little trowel. This one's from Gardener Supply. It's very well loved. And my pair of Felcos here. My irrigation supplies, which I could probably take that out now too, uh, because we're gonna be blowing our irrigation system out here pretty quick. Then I always have my gloves right here, along with some snips and a box cutter. So let's head up to the crab apple. I want to work on is actually right over there, but I forgot that I need to finish this project first. We have been cleaning out the uh, hay racks that are on the front fence line. Uh, they have done so well over the summer, but you can see that actually the superbina is what ended up taking over and it kind of um, grew over the top of everything. And then it wasn't in bloom all season. So it looked green for uh, like the last little bit with a bunch of blooms down in here. And that could be like a pruning thing too. Like I could have pruned on them a little bit better through the season. So you can still see some pretty Bordeaux and magenta underneath. But we are getting these pulled because I might deck these out for winter if I get enough energy. <laughs> I have such a bad habit of getting a bunch of different projects started and then not finishing. So anyway, finish this one first, then move on to pruning. I am just cutting them off at the base and leaving the root ball and the soil in the hay rack. You can see how well that cocoa fiber held up. I know that's been a huge question about these type of containers, like how much water they retain. But if you get the proper cocoa fiber and don't do like budget craft store stuff, it really does work really well. Anyway, so leaving the soil because it acts as a really great frog for branches like of evergreens and red twig dogwoods, I can just stick them down in the soil, water them one time, and then they'll freeze in place. Also, you can see the drip irrigation that we had running behind all the hay racks. See, it just kind of follows the whole fence line along the top, and you couldn't see this. So the plants grew so much. Well, I mean, you can see how thick they are. Anyway, each basket has four two gallon per hour emitters run to it. And we ran it 15 minutes a day for most of the summer, except for when it was like probably 95 and up. We ran it twice a day and everything responded really great. But I just wanted to let you know that we're just gonna leave this in place. This will, this will stay through the course of the winter and it'll be just fine. Um, all the water like runs out of it. Um, so it doesn't hang on to anything through the winter, so we shouldn't have any issues. And just like that, they're all cleaned out. 
my word. And also, for those of you who wanted to know, all of these hay racks came from Garden Artisans. Um, they've got them in multiple different lengths, um, and they have the cocoa fiber liners that are pre-molded that fit, and you can either order them with or without the cocoa fiber, because I know some people like to um, line them like with something different with moss or burlap, things like that. I like the cocoa fiber a lot. So anyway, Garden Artisans sent all of these out for this project earlier on, and that's pretty much the only reason why we were able to do it. And I have no idea whether or not I will actually uh, decorate all of these. I mean, that would be an enormous amount of work. Look at all of those. I need to find somebody who's like cutting down a pine tree somewhere if I'm gonna attempt that project. Whoa, I look like a ghost. So bright out here. So this is the tree I'm gonna be working on. You can see the um, dead branches, they're just kind of scattered in and throughout the nice ones. So this tree has been dealing with fire blight actually since we moved in and I've been trying to manage it. And it's one of those things that's a little bit hard to get on top of when it has already spread quite a bit. Let me show you the other side of the tree. Yeah, you can see more right in there. And there's the big one I need to take out. So fire blight is a bacteria that can enter your tree usually when the tree is in bloom in the springtime when it's a little bit more, like it's just starting to turn warm and a little more humid. Those are prime conditions for fire blight to infect and spread. Um, it can enter through the blooms, like pollinators can actually spread the bacteria from tree to tree. Um, it can enter through natural wounds or openings on the tree. So if you've had a big rainstorm or windstorm that has caused damage to leaves or like little branches have broken and caused a new open fresh wound, it can enter through those. So getting on top of your, your tree, like after you've noticed that this has happened, like you have fire blight, you'll notice it because you'll have little branches that start to look scorched and burned, fire blight, that's where it gets its name. And they usually start to turn over like they look like a crook of a sh shepherd's hook um, and that's really indicative of fire blight it usually affects like um, apples and pears or anything within that kind of um, th those species of trees this is a crab apple so um, it's a malice it's in the same family uh, and it's something I've been trying to control and if you get on it early enough when it's just affected the new growth and just stay on top of it and prune it out at the proper times spray it pro appropriately um, then it's less likely to enter the old growth of the tree and it can present as either the the branches that i've explained or it can turn into like cankers that ooze like kind of a like a fluid from them anyway it can be a really bad thing if you let it go for too long so now is a great time to prune the tree and get this stuff out because you don't want to prune it out in the spring when it's actively growing because that's when it will actively spread that's when the bacteria is spreading and growing um, right now the tree is going dormant so it's not actively growing at all in fact it's going to sleep um, and the temperatures are pretty low usually the bacteria doesn't grow at all below about 50 degrees or so um, so anyway I'm gonna go in there and cut out the branches also it's nice to prune right now because you don't have to sterilize your pruners between every single cut which you can like you can prune out fire blight earlier but you have to sterilize between each cut and it just takes a whole lot longer so anyways I'm gonna get in there with my pull pruners I'm gonna make sure to take all of my branches down that are affected at least six inches below where I notice um, the fire blight stopping so that I've got a nice big buffer for it for it um, anyway I hope that this doesn't take a whole lot of time but we'll see once I get going this will make it a whole lot easier I think uh, we just recently put up a video about this pull pruner I've tried out a lot of different ones and I love this one so far So this is a really good example of a really infected branch. It was a little bit isolated. That was the biggest one that I needed to cut out today. And I went ahead and took it all the way down um, to the main branch because there was a little bit of healthy growth on here, but not a lot. And I would have had to take it off like at a really thick part of the branch and it would have looked really weird for the shape of the tree. So now I just have like a few more little random cleanup branches up in there. And then I think I've got it pretty much out. So I asked Aaron to come out here and help me with the tallest branch that I couldn't reach. How's it going, Aaron? Good. <laughs> I don't know what's stuck on. It's. <laughs> How did it get stuck? <laughs> 
Well, I think what happened, Aaron, is that you let go of the string and you pulled the pruner out from the tree and it just drew the string up through the tree. I'm gonna... Well, hey, hey, <laughs> why don't you um, try to pop it off with the... That's not gonna work. Are you sure? Yeah, because you can't get the right leverage on that branch. Where there's a will, there's a way. I did it! <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Did Thank I? you. No, it looks good. Oh, look, good job? look who's up in there. Hey, Russell, what are you doing? Oh, he's way up there. Yeah. Can you guys see him? He's like right here. Russell. Well, anything else I can screw up for you? <laughs> no. <laughs> you got it. Okay. That makes me happy. Yeah. I think this uh, tree is pretty clean now yeah. for the most part. Looks way better. Also, I just noticed how beautiful this ash tree is looking gorgeous fall color. So we've got pretty much all of the branches out that were infected that I can see anyway right now while the tree still has a few leaves, a few, <laughs> a lot of leaves left on it. So once it defoliates completely, I'll be able to see a little bit better, um, like anything little that I missed and I'll come out here and make sure to clean that up. Uh, this is one of my favorite trees that we have on this property. This and the ash tree right next to it actually. Um, and they both have issues right now. So the ash has borers and the crab apple has this fire blight. And so I'm gonna fight really hard to keep them healthy and keep them alive because I love them. So I've just gotta pick up the little piles that I have hanging out. There's one in front there. Um, and that's another really important thing to help it not spread you just want to make sure to keep everything really clean so that means all of the leaves that come down I need to make sure to be like fastidious about picking those up and making sure that it's super clean and then um, also like any fruit that falls usually the birds this is a persistent crab the um, crab apples stay on the tree um, until the birds clean them up so typically that's not a problem but anything that I find on the ground needs to be picked up because bacteria can winter over and stuff like that other than pruning the fire blight out and then making sure everything is always really clean around the area there are some things that you can spray um, so typically what we've always done down at the garden center is we have have a uh, active gradient is streptomycin it's a fire blight spray specifically and it's a wettable powder and you mix it up and you spray it when the tree is in bloom and typically we'll do like two or three sprays because not all the blooms open all at the same time um, so we'll do a spray and then a week later do another spray and then a week later um, and that way it kind of manages the uh, bacteria at the peak time when it wants to spread. And then I've heard of other people doing like um, late winter copper um, applications. Um, and I've never done that. And maybe that's something that I need to address and look into. I'm not an expert in the arena of fire blight. So it's definitely somewhere where I can learn. And I you know, would love to figure out a way to like really get on top of it because I have this crab apple and I've got a hawthorn that has it as well that I would really like to keep as too because it's got beautiful uh, berries on it. So anyway, um, I'm gonna clean this up and then we're gonna go work in the garden a little bit. Ooh, look at there. Little fungi popping up. How cute. Also gonna pick these up so the spores don't spread. <laughs> look at those. So there you have it, there's the branches that I cut out. The tree looks a heck of a lot better. And you do not wanna compost any of these branches. You either wanna burn them or dispose of them completely, get rid of them. Also, even though the fire blight is not active right now, so we didn't have to worry about disinfecting the pruner blades every time I made a cut, I will make sure to disinfect it before I touch any other tree with it, just to be safe. One of the joys of gardening. <laughs> All right, let's survey the damage here. We've got a Roma tomato and a zucchini that are completely frostbitten and a basil. This corn I've been needing to clean out for a while. I cut most of it for bundles and have been using it in decorating. We've got another tomato there, a butternut squash, which I will take a few of these inside. It looks like there's three good ones. This has nothing in it. This is one of the beds I'm going to clear out till um, add some fertilizer and plant with garlic today. There's my super fantastic tomato. There are a few carrots left that I will uh, leave in the bed until I'm ready to use them. A uh, cantaloupe, which I'm a little bummed about. I'm going to still pull these and see if they're good. I think they may still be good. We've got a couple pepper plants, another tomato. There's the bell peppers looking pretty bad. Another bed of corn, 
kind of windblown. We've got a honeydew melon over here, which again, there may be some decent melons in there. <laughs> Look at the zinnias, how sad. More basil. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna set the camera up and start working. Um, this is just pretty easy stuff. I'm just gonna be pulling stuff out uh, and loading it into the trailer and then just getting all this whole area cleared. And then I'm hoping to plant garlic in two of the beds. So if you remember, I had garlic in both of the corn beds uh, before the corn was planted this year. So I'm going to rotate the garlic over to this bed right here, which had potatoes in it earlier and then zinnias. And then the other one, like I said, the other garlic will be in this bed where I had uh, peas and beans, also had a crookneck squash and some other things. I wonder how long this is gonna take me. I should time myself. Where's my phone? Time lapses always make things look so nice and quick and efficient. All right, it's 12.23. Here we go. Halfway done, and I do have to admit that I'm kind of liking this look. This means far less work and I do like the tidy look after the abundance of this season. There is some spinach left in this bed, and there were a few beets right here, which I don't think are gonna do much of anything, and then the carrots. I think I've got more foliage and stuff on this side, so this is gonna be a little bit more work. So I know that probably looked like it took 30 seconds or less, it took about an hour and a half, so it's almost two o'clock. It was like 12.30 right when I started. Not too bad. So on this half of the garden, I still have yet to clean out the little piles of cherry tomatoes that were falling off. Um, there's some spinach that is harvestable. I'm gonna get that harvested and put into some salads. We've got uh, cilantro that's looking great and some bull's blood beets. And then right on the outside here, I kind of gathered whatever produce was left. Uh, that I think might be good. I'm not sure, but there were four. There were more than this, but there were four that were that looked good enough. Honeydew melons. There are several cantaloupe. I didn't harvest all the green tomatoes because I just don't have the time, but I got some of them. Probably quite a good pile. Three butternut squash and four watermelon. So now you can see my trellises again. These are the SX round trellis from Gardener Supply, and I used them as tomato cages even though they're not proper tomato cages but they worked out great they weren't like super strong for the huge tomatoes but if you keep them your tomatoes pruned like you should be doing like i didn't do they would work just fine and i like the look of them a lot like a lot better than a traditional frame my word it's gotten a lot warmer than i thought it was going to today i started off with two coats this morning it was that chilly um but it does feel really good to get stuff like this buttoned up just because just have it clear and that way if we do decide to come in and plant some winter crops and maybe make some domes and um, get some stuff going in there i can i don't know if i'm gonna actually get to that but at least the beds are cleaned out and ready to go if we do get the time to do that um so now i'm going to go get all the stuff to plant garlic um, i'm going to get some biotone starter fertilizer and we're going to till that in and then get i think italian i think i might just do 100 percent italian this next year i have the best luck with italian so i decided to take a quick break we're actually going to run down to the garden center and get a little bit of garlic so i'm going to be planting my italian that i planted last year so i'll be taking from my own crop um, but then i want to try something new this year i think i did like what german red red toke chestnut I think those are the other three I did last year, and I think the chestnut did the best out of all three of them, but they all were not as good as Italian, but I don't want to just get stuck in an, an Italian rut. Italian. We don't want to get stuck in a garlic rut, so I'm gonna go see what we've got down at the garden center and maybe try something different. Let's see, we've got Germador. It's a soft neck, which I want to stay with soft neck because they store better. Korean red's a hard neck. And then I did this one last year. So, this is it. That's a big brute right there. Check out this garlic. Wow. I don't feel that that was sincere. Oh. <laughs> it kinda looks like garlic to me. It's huge. All right, I'm gonna grab some Italian garlic here. This 
is from my harvest this year. We'll start with five heads and see how far we get. Hey, Noah, what are you doing, buddy? You guys want to know something interesting? No is also a polydactyl. You gonna let me get close enough, buddy, so I can show off your toes? They're so cute. Oh, and there's Russell. Hi, Katie. What a good boy. One foot has a white extra toe and one foot has a black extra toe. This is some of the Italian that I grew from last year that will go in one of the beds. And then this is the Germador that I just picked up at the garden center uh, and that will go in the other one. So now I need to grab the tiller and some fertilizer and we can get this thing going. Isn't that just a thing of beauty? I just love seeing freshly tilled soil all ready for planting. And I did sprinkle some biotone into the bed before I tilled it, so the whole thing's been worked up with that fertilizer. And then you can see, I think you can see, down in each individual um, row, I sprinkled a little bit more fertilizer because garlic is a super heavy feeder. So to get nice big heads like this, you have to use quite a bit of food. So the rows are about six to eight inches apart from one another and I plant each clove about two to four inches deep. So now I just need to separate these out. Each individual clove that I pull off of this main head right here will form another head. And you wanna to try to leave as much of the paper on as possible because it helps keep water away from the clove. That first head of garlic had 13 cloves. So that means we will have, whoa, whoa. So that means we will have 13 new heads of garlic next July. So I hope you guys can see that okay with all the shadows going on. It's really bright and sunny, but I was able to fit 70 cloves of garlic in this one bed, um, which I think is close to what I fit last year. But you can see if I pull one out, I plant it with the pointy side, which is right here facing up because this is the side where the roots will come out and this is the side the stalk will come out. So now I just need to cover them over with soil and water them in. First garlic bed is done. So now I just need to do that one more time over here. All right, so there we have it. Vegetable garden is all cleaned out, garlic's planted, and I did wanna show you guys that I went and got a couple of great big stones. So I'm gonna be uh, bringing gravel out a little bit and then it'll be mulch on the front side here um, as we start cutting out flower beds out here. Um, but it is kind of a nice transition because you can just step here and then up into the garden because it is a little bit of a step up. Uh, but I did make sure to run the drip tube, which I'm using the quarter inch soaker uh, alongside each row of garlic. And I still have the spigots on in those beds um, because even though we're gonna be blowing out the sprinkler system in a week or two, they'll get one or two really deep soaks before going into winter. And then in beds like this one here and you know across the way, these don't have anything in them. So I just turn the spigots off. I love that we can do that and just control the water. We walk back through here. It's kind of fun just seeing little 
little spots of green. There's the other garlic bed. Oh, and I was left with a rosemary, which I will need to dig out, uh, probably get to that tomorrow. And there's a lemon thyme there. And then I've got chives still in a container, which I will probably just leave right here. They're super tough. There's the other stone, and then there's my big massive project staring at me in the face all day, every day. So I also wanted to give you a quick update on these hydrangea trees since they are close to the vegetable garden. There's one here and then one on the other side over there. Uh, so I did plant these when it was really hot outside and they clearly shocked. They burned, like their foliage burned pretty bad and a lot of it dropped off, but it has started to push new foliage and there's even a couple of fresh blooms. So I think that they're gonna be okay. I'm really hoping they are because I think it's gonna be really beautiful right here. Um, these are limelight hydrangea trees, so you can see they're on a standard there. So what I'm going to do late winter, early spring, I'm going to come out here and I'm going to cut it way back. So really shear it up into a ni nice tight sphere. That way the plant, like the root system, has less area to send energy, energy to. It can focus a little bit more and I'm hoping that that helps. And this video is probably getting long, but I'm gonna give you an update on the asparagus since we're talking vegetables today. Here we are at the asparagus beds, which have fall leaves all over in them. And you can see that the wind comes right through here and just blows the asparagus down. Uh, it has been like that for the last two years. I really should just stake it up. I mean, easy fix, but did, have I done it? No. Um, so, this is second year asparagus, which is really exciting. I planted them from crowns um, now two years ago. So this next spring, I should be able to start harvesting because you can see like how much they've stooled out. The first year there was only like one or two stalks. This year there's a whole bunch. So I'm thinking that they were able to soak in a lot of energy and really establish that root, root system down there so that hopefully we have a really abundant crop next year. And kind of the sad part about these beds right here is we're actually gonna be removing them. Um, Aaron wanted to do it this year. He's wanted, wanted to do it since pretty much day one and then I put the asparagus in there and I was like, we can't, I'm already a year in. Like I need to get them to a third year and then you know, let me experience that and then I can dig them up and move them somewhere else and I'll be okay. Um, so I really just wanna see what they're like in the spring, uh, see how much I can harvest, and then probably next fall, or maybe late spring even, I'll be digging them up and moving them to hopefully a new location that I can figure out somewhere, um, because we are gonna be doing something different with this spot. I've told you multiple times right here that this right here is a roof to a root cellar that you access through the potting shed, and I don't want it there anymore. It's a creepy little root cellar, and I just wanna have the whole thing like just punched down in and leveled up, and then I'm thinking we'll remove these and create another black picket fence uh, section and do like cut flowers and maybe more vine crops and things like that. I don't know. I mean, these ideas and plans are always evolving and you know, we have a few months of winter ahead of us and things can change drastically. I mean, they can change in the course of a few hours with just Aaron and I out here talking about options and things and trying to like compromise on what we want to do. Um, so anyway, yeah, who knows what's gonna happen with this area. It could stay like this for five more years, who knows. So I think I'm gonna end the video right now. I do have a couple other things I'm gonna do outside, but it's just checking some containers to make sure they don't need water. I might pull that big section of coleus I showed you in the beginning of today's projects, um, just because I've been walking by it today and it's just horrible. It's like extra wilted, more so than last night. And I'm standing right here by the brick circle area and all the dahlias are done. They all got nailed last night. Now that is a little sad. So anyway, I feel like we got a whole bunch accomplished today. I'm really happy with it. Always feels good to have a super great day where I can check off lots of things off of my list. So anyway, thank you guys for hanging out with me today and we will see you in the next video. Bye.